My father who's breaking his back and getting black lung, I can make as much as he makes in two months in one night by boxing. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Hey, Brian Lally here, Hollywood native, and you're going to be watching... Kind of like being at a Steve Miller concert. The audience sings along. Hey, I'm wearing a festive summer barbecue shirt and long underwear. You figure it out. Well, I'm here with my partner in crime, as always, Scott Williams. Scott, who do we have on the show today? Today, Brian, we have a great guest, Doug Cavanaugh. Doug Cavanaugh, good friend, great guy. Doug started out as an actor. He's still acting now. He's in Pittsburgh as we speak. He is a boxing aficionado, specifically Pittsburgh. A lot of great boxers out of there, and he's a surfer, a surf instructor, and he wrote a book on the amazing Butch Van Arsdale. I mean, he's amazing, but he'd probably be the notorious Butch Van Arsdale, one of the guys that started it all. So stick around for SoCal native Doug Cavanaugh. What were we talking about in the car? What weren't we we talking about in the car? Save it till we got here. Yeah, all of it. Should have wrote it down. It was about writing, right? Probably. Bukowski? Yeah. Yeah, Bukowski. And the old writers about LA. Yeah. Who really knows. <clears throat> only with Tony. I only want to make sure we bring up that <laughs> the, how, how long it took him to get to class and how millennials don't do it or Gen X. That's all we wanted to talk about. It's the only we had Tony Montez in here. I called him up. So the only thing we want to talk about is how much time how hard it was to get to rehearsal, and we never complained. I'd go from the Valley to Venice, take me an hour. I didn't give a shit. You know, we'd go anywhere to rehearse, day or night. You know what I mean? He was in Long Island, took the train into town, walked in the snow to HB Studios. You know, it sounds like an old thing. Now, they, you know, we try to get a guy to rehearse. Hey, you gonna you rehearse between classes? I couldn't. Why not? I was tired. Oh, my God. Really? I'm like, can you do it on the phone? Well, my phone, you know my earbuds i'm like dude you want to be an actor or not yeah <laughs> have you seen TikTok? yeah yeah they're in yeah, silver got lake thousand yeah huh? they're in silver lake but yeah. they won't drive over to the valley they won't go to echo park <laughs> yeah <for real>. Jeez. <laughs> so that's the only thing i called him and said we had to talk about it's the only thing he was here 90 minutes we didn't talk about it we had a good talk but i'm just saying afterwards i was like that's the only thing we said is this Wait. an actual phenomenon what nowadays is sure oh my oh my god yeah. bob carnegie would have sent you packing yeah but it's different now it's different for carnegie it's different for everybody it's people just don't want to do it you can't yell at them there is no more three moment game they've been safe behind the computer zoom and all that yeah really yeah. you remember the three moment game vaguely the three moment game is <clears throat> you would ask a provocative question mm -hmm. and then someone would repeat it and best based on their intonation you would work off them and tell them what they were thinking how they were behaving mm -hmm. and so i did this eight years ago right and i thought well it's getting really politically correct you can't really say the shit you used to say you just can't say it to people anymore yeah and it, and it really hampers their progression because it's really important to say something nasty to someone and have them take it in because you need to say something nasty for someone to be affected by it all right so there was this, uh, oh, what was her name? Oh, anyway, I, I forget her name. She'll be mad at me. She was mad at everything. It was a Persian girl, <laughs> right? She was mad at everything. So Bahara, and I get her up there, very nice lady, and I get her up on one side, and there's a dude, he's kind of a timid guy, but he's like 6'6", six, six. and it, this woman's like five foot four, And so I get her on the other side, and I go, she's not going to go straight for the shitter. You know, she's not going to the gutter immediately. So I go... I'll pick her pretty safe, you know, she's not going to ask him anything too, uh, you know, too blue. So she goes, have you ever, ever had a deke up your asshole? <laughs> and I'm like, people in the class, they're cracking up. They're cracking up. So the chicks go up and they start firing at each other. They go, when was the last time you sucked a cock? Was it this week? So they're not, you know, they're they're not pulling any punches. They're not asking, have you ever? Uh -huh. They're like, I know you did. Was it in the last two days? 
You know what I mean? And so that was great. But it's just nowadays, unless they take control, it's like, oh, you can't say that kind of stuff. But it was funny. But again, this is eight years back. Things have changed. But these young women were just going nuts on each other, just going, you're a whore. Anybody ever said you're a whore? Anybody ever said I'm a whore? Seems like they have before. Get thee to a nunnery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to get people to rehearse. And, you know, just demand it of them. You know, I tell people in class, I'm not going to put my foot up your ass. I'm not going to make you do anything. But if you show up for class unprepared, you're going home. That's it. That's my that's my hard edge. I don't need to yell at anybody and make sure I'm I'm I'm, you know, angrier or tougher than kids. You know what I mean? When I say kids, you know, I mean 18, yeah. 24. I don't need to talk shit to them. I just tell them, "Hey, you ready?" "No, you going to bring your assignment?" "Go the fuck home." And then if they do it a couple of times, they don't come back. You know, I mean, because it's important. Yeah. So, so when did you start acting? Jeez, the moment I left the womb. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, wow. When did I start? When I was a kid, you know, junior high school, you know, junior yeah. high school theater and stuff like that. And high school theater. And yeah. Stuff like that. It's yeah, just, I was I... too scared for that. <clears throat> I really get kind of envious. Tony was talking about last time about he wanted to do it like five. And I always go to Pacino. What is it? Life on a Wire? Bird on a Wire? His book? You know, Pacino's yeah, yeah, autobiography. Yeah. And it's like, he knew at five. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. I, I did too. I know. I can't, let's just put it this way. I can't remember ever wanting to do anything else. Yeah. And I can't ever picture myself doing anything else. Mm -hmm. So that's why I just knew I wasn't a fly by night. So you did junior high plays. Did you get into yeah. it in high school? I got into it a little bit in high school. I didn't get along with the drama crowd. They just seemed too artificial and faux energetic and just oh hi my name is you know too full of hand you know very mm -hmm, kind of yeah. new yorky hand movement what are you guys mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i just didn't buy it so i stayed away from play production mm -hmm. i actually got drafted to do plays by the teacher who liked me uh, mr duran may he rest in peace but uh, he was our uh, american lit teacher mm -hmm. and uh he liked me you know i like to act so he just sort of drafted me right so yeah so I've, that's all i've ever wanted to do i just was always amazed at uh the way certain actors could completely arrest your attention. Because I didn't have a big attention span. I mean, my right. brain, I mean, I have to wrestle it to the ground to get it to do anything that it doesn't want to do, you mm -hmm. know? So if you could do that without me having to wrestle it to the ground, I was very grateful. So yeah, I could watch someone like Marlon Brando, or we were talking about Robert Shaw, guys mm -hmm. like that who you just, you know, you lost yourself right. watching these people. Right. They just, they chewed up the scenery. They ate your attention. It was right. great. I'm like, wow, I hope I can affect people like that someday. Right. Get people really out of themselves and really into another happy, right. good place where their imagination's stimulated and yeah. whole new worlds open up to them. Not to get too flowery on you here. Yeah. So. And were you disappointed <clears throat> when you couldn't do that? Yeah, I was crushed. <laughs> so absolutely crushed. When did you gobsmacked? Start, when did you start studying? Did you <clears throat> read about people? Did you read the Mutant King? Did you read? I hated the Mutant King. Okay, that's well, a I'm fan just... letter. That's not a biography. That's oh, a fan. That's okay. a love letter to James Dean. I hated that book. Anyway, I'm sorry. There's my opinion for that. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how you started finding the path of studying or, or I, finding your My first your teacher way. was right out of high school. I studied with a teacher who did John Cassavetti's groundbreaking film Shadows. Right. She was the star of that. Her name was Lelia Goldoni. She taught out of the White Fire Theater. So I started okay. going to her. And right she, on Ventura? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been around that long? Oh, yeah. It's oh, been I didn't know that. a long that. time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I was got, that's how I learned about John Cassavetti's and the impact he had on directors and on actors and an improvisation right. and stuff. And she studied under Lee Strasberg. And you know, of course, you, you study with the Strasberg people. And all they do is badmouth the Meisner people. The Meisner right. people badmouth the Strasberg people. Yeah. Dude, and how much did that hamper us? How much did that hamper us listening to that fucking <clears throat> bullshit? Yeah. Strasberg has great exercises. Yes. And to say that we had the only way, you know, it was the only way where we come from. Right. And, you know, I don't want every, every podcast to be bad mouthing because I, I met great people. I met you there. Yeah. You know, and we and we we had the same vision. We had the same point of view as how we wanted to act, how we wanted to study. And in Larry Moss's book, he talks about any teacher who says, I have the only way is just trouble. Yeah. And he starts off thanking nine teachers or something. So, yeah. Yeah. Bad mouthing. There's no there's no point because because there's the emotional recall. Is that what it was? It was lots of things, yeah. Emotional recall, just using your own experiences, right. whereas Stella Adler, she was more of an advocate of using the imagination, sure. which I agree sure. with. 
I think it starts with Adler and Strasberg, to be honest with with the group theater, because well, she sure. went back and studied with Stanislavski. And said, I, I got the way y'all are doing it wrong. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, easy there, shotgun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and Meisner <clears throat> followed her yeah. line from Stanislavski. Yeah. And Strasberg's famous line was, I'm not teaching Stanislavski, I'm teaching Strasberg. Right. Right, but yeah. then you had Bobby Lewis, you had Kazan was I love teaching. Bobby Lewis. Yeah, I every, wish there was more on Bobby Lewis. Right? There is a book. I read a book on it. Well, there's uh, books, but there's only one video I've found of him. I'm yeah. sure there's something else out there, but... Yeah, he's Monty Clift, Montgomery Clift's guru. Yeah. Meryl Street, yeah. Tommy Lee Jones. I mean... I didn't know Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. There you go. Talk about keeping it real. Yeah. Those three right there. Yeah. There's another voice from the group theater. It's like, who's wrong and who's right? It's what works for you. We're not here to serve this altar you're creating around this, yeah. you know, this approach. That's yeah. what interests us. What works for you? Right. Bruce Lee's way. What works for you and what right. doesn't? Toss out what doesn't work for right. you. Right. You know, yeah. Archie Moore told Cassius Clay he was doing it all wrong. Well, what do you know? Heavyweight champion of the world. Yes. Yeah. And he knocked out Archie Moore. Right. <laughs> So much for doing it all wrong. Yeah. I met him. I you. met him on the corner of Beverly and La Brea. He was driving a Rolls Royce convertible Corniche. He had a gangster lean so hard he was driving, and he was a big dude. He was <laughs> driving from the passenger seat. He was this far. He was looking out over the passenger window, and I was just like, "What's up, <laughs> champ?" And he goes, "Ah." Hey. <sighs> I said, "How's it going, champ? Big fan." Oh. Ah. <laughs> What was he on? Uh, he was just on, I guess he was on the early phases of uh, Parkinson's, so <laughs> he didn't know. Yeah, I met George Foreman on Pico in La Cienega. He was driving Excalibur. So that was Ali when I said, hey, champ, this is Foreman when he was in the in the bad days. You uh, know what I mean? With okay. the tough guy days. Sure, I was dry, sure. riding with a buddy of mine in a tow truck, and we were going out, you know, hooking up cars together. And he was in his car, and I was like, hey, what's up, champ? And he was like, <laughs> and I was, I thought he was, I thought his look was going to push me out of the friggin' toe. He was trip. imitating Sonny Liston. That was, yeah, his he hero. made it, might have been. That was his hero. Oh, really? And they were stable mates. Yeah. Oh, wow. When George came out of into okay. the pros. That was his first, yeah. So you started studying? Yeah, under Lalia. And, and how I just, old were you? I was 18, 19 okay. years old. Yeah. So it was a serious acting class. It was, yeah. Ooh, she yelled and screamed and kicked people out. And just, it was, it was old school Strasburg, you know. Right. Strasburg was that way. He was a yeller and a screamer yeah. and just, you know, would humiliate people. And I got humiliated plenty. But, but I learned a lot and I learned an appreciation for art. She taught me that in all of its forms. You know, she made me read, read Hemingway short stories. I'm thinking, what does this have to do with acting? Well, yeah. you're feeding the well which i didn't know right she was right. like mr miyagi she wouldn't always tell you her reason she's right. like just read it yeah you know, she was a sicilian lady so you didn't argue right you know but she had all these great stories about working with cassavetes and working you know she was an in invasion of the body snatchers the right. remake and just all these neat little anecdotes she would share with us so. sierra madre invasion so. of the body snatchers that's where it was filmed downtown sierra oh madre. is that right yeah. oh okay didn't yeah. know didn't Looks exactly the same. One of those yeah. places that haven't really changed. Oh. oh. And she's with Scorsese in his early days. Alice doesn't live here anymore. Right. You know? Wow. She, so, you know, you yeah. got a taste of what he was like in his early days. Right. So she's, yeah, she really, really instilled a lot of really cool stuff. But then, you know, of course, I went away, though, thinking that nothing matters but Strasbourg style. And then I started learning other stuff. You know, I trained with um, uh, Alan Miller for a while. You know, he was Barbara Streisand's coach and stuff like that. And he, he had some good stuff. I like really liked his book on acting. And Ernie Martin, who, you know, knew Meisner. And, and I don't know that. Or Ernie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He okay. was Ernie. I trained with him for a little while. He knew Bob Carnegie. And Bob, you know, oh, I mentioned really? that to Bob. And I was like, oh, I like Ernie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bob knew Ernie. He was married to Ann Wedgworth. Remember Lana from Three's Company? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. See, people just know her as Lana. And that's right. a shame. Very respected Broadway actress. Really? Oh, yeah. She acted with, uh, I think she's one Tony. She acted with Pacino, De Niro. She acted with all of them. They all know Annie Wedgworth. Oh, wow. She was fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but she talked just like Lana in real life. <laughs> oh, hi. She had that breathy Marilyn Monroe voice. And it was it was real. It, right. Uh, just something right. else. But I started training with Ernie Martin for a while. And, and that kind of gave me a taste of Meisner. And then uh, I found Playhouse West. I don't even remember how. But uh, not just, I, I still think I had the shortest interview in history with Bob Carnegie. Right. You had to audit a class and then you would have to talk to him afterwards. So I'm waiting in line. He's talking to each person for 10, 15 minutes. Or I sat down. I said, I just kind of put my head in my hands. I just want to get out of my head. He puts his hand up. He goes, 
come back at this time da, 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 and gives me the time and sends me away well wow. like you're uh, in the right place so right yeah. right and i knew i was so yeah and i learned a lot starting yeah. from square one yeah Jeez. well you weren't there glenn vincent was gone by the time you got there yeah. so glenn was a, a good teacher for me especially in the beginning he's very honest it made you be honest at all times so where did where did it take you where did your you know theater yeah, I did a lot television. of plays and stuff like that. You know, did a couple little TV gigs that I'm not going to talk about because they're embarrassing. I mean, oh really? I, I won't tell you. Not not online. <laughs> Rum Pumper Six? <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that. <laughs> okay. Nothing like that. Just stuff stuff that would make Saved by the Bell look like an Emmy award winning show. Silk stockings? Yeah, there you go. No. <laughs> so you know, just little things here and there, but some theater, which was a lot of fun. I enjoy theater. And um, was Franco there when you were there early? Was were you working with him? Because yeah. I know you guys did that punk rock play. What was that called? Slam. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. Especially when I slapped him in the nuts, and I, his girlfriend let out an audible gasp in the audience. <laughs> was he wearing? Was he wearing a cup? No, or he didn't no. expect it. It's just it was a natural moment. I mean, I'm I'm supposed to be he's I'm supposed to be his idol. I'm bigger and tougher than he is in the play. And at one point he gets in my face like this, so I just kind of palmed his nuts. Pow! And he goes, oh! he, he collapsed into the corner and his girlfriend goes, <gasps> <laughs> I forget the actress. She was in the office or something like that. Oh, oh, oh. Marla. 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 Yeah. yeah and the afterwards, practice. I, yeah, the practice. Yeah. That's it. Right. The office practice. Right. I walked up to her after I said, sorry to ruin his marriage prospects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew like, that wasn't going to work when we, we would go up there. <clears throat> and I think she had, I think it was her, had a rack of guitars. And I picked up one of the guitars. She's like, I go, what do you mean? That was a Marlowe. So? He's like, yeah, you guys can't come over here without calling. I'm like, who the fuck are you talking to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was short-lived. Wow. They'd moved in together in the place up in Coldwater. Oh, did they? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Didn't know that. I mean, I like Marla. I mean, I didn't get to know her that well. She yeah. She nice. She was, she was nice. Yeah. She's a sweetheart. Don't touch her shit. Yeah, just don't, don't touch her. your shit, especially not her boyfriend's uh, package. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, don't, I just, I felt bad. <laughs> it was really spontaneous. I just, pow! Right. You could yeah. hear it. Yeah. You could hear her gasp like that. Oh, man, it was terrible. Yeah, but we did Slam, and James came to, he came to Playhouse West about three weeks after me. Oh, really? That yeah. close? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very close. Yeah. Yeah. A decade younger than me. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I watched him rise up pretty quickly in the ranks, right. you know? Next thing I know, he's on an episode of Pacific Blue. Remember that show? Getting sure. a SAG card with yeah. Rick Rosevich. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I used to love Slider from Top Gun. He was cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. Roxanne. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, but he, yeah, about three weeks after me, and we had a lot of people in that class, a lot of good, a lot of so good. So that was twenty five years ago. Yeah, that was nineteen ninety six, October of ninety six. Yeah, because he was he was nineteen. Yeah, he's forty four. Yeah. This week. Weird. Huh? Week. Yeah. Weird how fast time goes. But yeah, that was a great class. That was a really good class. I think Marley Shelton was in that class too. Remember? Yeah. Remember Marley? Sure. Yeah, she was yeah. really good. Yeah. She had a weird energy that just translated really well on stage. Yeah. You couldn't take your eyes off her either. It's like, what is making her tick? Right. It's real, but I don't know what it is. Right. <laughs> I still like watching her. Right. And wasn't she a famous, uh, wasn't she in some, was, was it a, what, what's the movie about the, the Sandlot? Wasn't she in that? Wasn't she the lifeguard? Who was the lifeguard that all the kids were enamored of? Do I have the right movie? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Eh. We'll Marley Shelton. The Sandlot or something. Who was who was the uh, who was the uh, lifeguard that they were all just smitten with? The guy? No, it was a girl. <laughs> oh, it was a girl. I thought you were going to lifeguard with Sam. What's his name? Sam Elliott. Yeah, remember Sam that? <laughs> that was, was it called Malibu Beach? Did he had a mustache then though? No, right? he, he had always a had a mustache. He had a porn yeah, stash he had a dark back mustache. Then. Yeah. Sorry. I'm slow on the draw here. Yeah, it's okay. Never mind the man behind the curtain. <clears throat> we will. He's not doing anything. Scott is a genius. Scott really is. He can he can do just asking, right? Okay. Hold on. He can do many, many things. None of them fast. <laughs> we can edit out all this nonsense. Well, we I'm, might not want to edit it. Where I'm out. screwing up. We will edit this out. It is Marley, isn't it? Yeah. Grand Canyon? No. Lifeguard role, babe. Wendy Peppercorn. Yeah, Peppercorn, that's it. Yeah. Peppercorn. So the sandlot's sandlot. like a that's that's a 
a cult film. Everybody loves the Sandlot. So right. Yeah, Wendy Peppercorn. Everybody knows that name except me. I couldn't remember. Peppercorn. Yeah, Marley was something else though. I remember when she was hitting on me. I was like, dude, I don't date lifeguards. <laughs> <laughs> she was at playoffs. She was. Yeah. yeah. She just had this really interesting energy. I don't know. I can't. I, I can't even explain what it, her affect was. It was just so like an alien creature who's looking at you like you're the alien creature. Mm -hmm. So she kind of turned it on Before you. Before she uh, throws a lawsuit on me, she did not hit on me. I'm just saying. <laughs> her not too. outwardly. She was really good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she was talented. So Yeah, we had a lot. Shawnee Smith, remember her? Sure. She, she came a little later, I think. Yeah, she, well, I think she'd been back and forth, I think. But she came in. I wanted to work on the Shrike with her. Mm -hmm. And I said to Bob, I want to work on the strike with her. He goes, does she write for it? I'm going, take it easy, partner. <laughs> That's your fucking child. Man, Brian, you know what I love doing? Yeah. I love tapping that subscribe button. Mm. I love it too, son. And just like all your dates, I tap it last. But nothing's as good as tapping this button you see brian here he's not always doing the best financially mentally physically for sure you want to help keep brian off the streets of hollywood there's a way you can help join us on patreon you want to tell him what we got on there buddy yes we have the general admission we have the backstage and we have the vip all access pass so please join today I'm due for a bath. In the arms of the <laughs> angel, I always here. The shit that man used to do, you know, to try to intimidate people, or he was so scared that somebody was working. But she was on the fucking uh, Ted Danson show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what was that called? God, I'm forgetting everything. Yeah. But she was... I'm surprised she didn't get an Emmy for that. She was so fucking good in that. Remember her in uh, the first Saw, remember? She had the... Oh, she was in all of them. contraption around her mouth. Right. Like, blow her mouth open. But she uh, was in four or five of them. Three yeah. or four of them at yeah, least. Yeah. 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 She, she did a Ted good job. Ted Danson, Doctor. Doctor Ted Danson show. Okay. Remember how Bob used to ride Ted Danson for the... You mean physically? We got, we got, no, we got 10 years to save the earth. I yeah. had like this chart, this clock. Well, Ted, we got five years, yeah. four, three years, Ted. Yeah. Three years to save the earth. You say it's going to blow. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> What's that show? That's the one. <clears throat> Becker. 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 Okay, yeah. Shawnee Smith was phenomenal in Becker. Yeah. I don't know whether it ran five, seven seasons. She should have got a fucking Emmy. Yeah. Nobody could have played that part like she did. Her. Yeah. Yeah. But another one that was yeah, fun you to probably watch. Know she had, movies. you, you know what? Shows, right? One thing I thought she would have been perfect in was that, remember, uh, uh, the train, the w train doesn't stop here anymore. The Tennessee Williams one about the little abused girl on the train tracks. No, I don't know that. It's one. on Twenty Seven Wagons Full of Cotton. Oh, okay. Yeah, the train doesn't stop here anymore. I think is what it is. I, I, I this is just a that. whole show about things I don't remember. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I bring them up. Shawnee yeah. Smith in that show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, did you start writing plays? No, I didn't write any plays. Uh, I've written some screenplays. I haven't been picked up yet. Hint, hint. Right. Nobody's listening. No, I was more like journalism and short stories and uh, stuff like that, biographies, histories, like esoteric history stuff, right. like kind of out of the way history stuff. So I just, I've always loved writing and reading, so it just kind of came out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so but uh, I'm still looking to act. And it's okay. Like I said, I, I always want to do that, but... Um, but writing is something I can do. It doesn't require anybody else. So, right. And so I do it. Right. Yeah. And everybody else is happy about that. <laughs> so you started writing. You were studying acting and pursuing acting work. Yeah. But then you started writing. Do you start with just articles? Articles. Actually, boxing history, if you can believe that. Boxing and organized crime, you know. The Irish always, one. Yeah. The there you go. It always fascinated me, organized crime and stuff like that. You know, and those Scorsese movies we all right. grew up with. Yeah. You know, you got to love that whole New York thing. So, so yeah, I mean, I was friends with Ike Williams, who was the lightweight champ in the 40s, who was uh, controlled by Frankie Carbo and Blinky Palermo, the mob, basically. Right. You know what I mean? And he's living in this horrible roach-infested place over on 5th and Pico. It was just awful. You know, just the squalor he was living in. But he would tell me stories about that stuff, and I knew him for several years, and 
one day I sat down in front of a one of those old typewriters, you know, those old fashioned typewriters and just started hammering out an article and freelance submitted it to a magazine about Ike, how the mob ruined him, but he helped break the mob and they bought it. Wow. 300 bucks. Wow. Yeah. All right. 1993, 300 bucks. That yeah. would take me a long way. So I'm working at Jerry's Deli and there's a boxer in there. Should have been a champion <clears throat> boxer in, in there. And he's, uh, he doesn't drink. And he doesn't like drunks. Uh-oh. And he's sitting there, and there's a guy over by... This is the, the old bar at Jerry's Deli when it was separate. There's a guy uh, standing by the television right by the door to the bowling alley, and he's loud and he's drunk during the day. He's like, yeah, you know, as a boxer. And this guy's playing Pac-Man, the boxer, and he's like... <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's loud, and he starts talking about Golden Gloves. Well, this guy was Golden Gloves champion of... Uh, United States. All right. No, you know who it is. I'm just not saying it yet. Okay. And so he gets up and he goes over to talk to the dude. He's like, so you were Golden Gloves? He goes, yeah. He goes, uh, what year was that? And he goes, well, you know, I've been in there for a long time. And he goes, but you're a champion. And this was Randy Shields. Oh, brother. And Randy Shields was the Golden Gloves champ of the United States. I think mm -hmm. it was 74. And he goes, what year were you champ? And the guy goes, 1974. And Randy's still at welterweight. You know, he's probably not more than 165, which is, but, but I'm, you know, I'm just saying he's not fighting. So he's, he's thin. About 5'11", he's thin. And he just got a look on his face. And this guy says, 1974. He goes, do you know Randy Shields? He goes, never heard of him. Randy takes him, pops him. This guy's probably 5'8", 200. Randy pops him up over a table into the corner of the booth. And he's like, he's like, no, you weren't. And he didn't swear or anything. He wasn't like that. Randy wasn't, he didn't drink. He didn't swear like the ladies, but he puts this guy up and over. And I come out from behind the bar and I'm like, Randy, Randy, go, man. You got to get out of here. He goes, did you hear what he said? I heard what he said. I saw what you did. You better get out of here. And I said, I'll take care of it. And Randy split. And the guy, the guy gets up. I mean, he was out. The guy gets up. He's like, Where'd he go? And I said, well, he took off. He goes, oh, ran away from me, didn't he? I'm like, buddy, you almost <laughs> died. You all, It was the 80s. You know, who cared? Right, Do right. you know about Sonny Shields, Randy's dad? No. Mm -hmm. He was a collection man on the Jersey Docks. I mean, a real collection man like like uh, like Rocky was supposed to right, be. Right, right. And so Sonny would come into bars in back when Pat's on Riverside was a was a rough fucking bar. Riverside and Laurel Canyon, everything's so pretty nowadays. That was a bad bar. Yeah. The stop was like a biker bar. That was on Wits at Moore Park in Studio City. They were rough fucking bars. So Sonny didn't drink and didn't like drunk. So he'd go into bars and he'd just start throwing down with people. He would just start, he would just go in and he wore Sansa belt, polyester up high and a wife beater. And this guy was 50 and he was fucking yoked. And I'm in, I'm in, whenever I'd see him coming to Jerry's, come, he'd come looking for trouble. I, he would come in and I'd just open up the beer, cool it. Yeah, we need eight cores. We need, uh, you know, and then I'm standing there and he walks by these three young dudes at a table, right? Mm -hmm. There's three of them and they're not small. And he fucking punches one dude in the jaw. The chair goes back, punches another in the chest. And they're like, what the fuck happened? He said, he tripped me. He tried to trip me. And they're like, dude. We didn't do anything. And, you know, he looks at me. I'm in the beer cooler. Uh, three cores. We need a couple Coronas. To, what's that? Brian, did you see this? Uh, no, Sonny, I didn't. I, 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 was, I was looking in the beer cooler when you come oh. in. And he was like, yeah, these dudes tried to trip me. I said, not a, not a good idea. Not a good idea. But he went all around the valley, you know, into his 60s, 70s. Wow. Just throwing down on dudes in bars. He was nuts. You don't have those people anymore. I mean, they go to jail. You know, it doesn't happen. But that was like the old valley. That was crazy. Yeah. And he was out of his effing mind. And Randy didn't do that kind of stuff. But Randy was the kind of guy that would be in a movie theater and he would, uh, and kids would be talking and something. Kids, young people, they could be in teens, 20s, and it could be 10 of them. And he'd stand up and he'd go, Excuse me, you have to be quiet now. They'd be like, What? He goes, you have to be quiet now. And for some reason, they're like, okay. 
there was weight behind those yeah. words. Yeah. Oh, geez. He didn't. And then story about him is he was at 4 and 20 on Laurel Canyon, and he had got a bodyguard's uh, license, a permit to uh, carry a gun. Uh, and so he was he was working on screenplays. He was trying to write screenplays this time. He's at 4 and 20, and two dudes come in to rob it. And he's sitting, you know, not too far back. So they pull guns on people. So Randy pulls out a gun and shoots one. Then oh a guy God. shoots him. And then he shoots back at the other guy. <laughs> you don't have those shootouts in 2022. Oh, geez. You know what I mean? Jeez. I think that was the 80s. It might have been early 90s. But back... I'm going to look that up in the newspaper archives. That's oh, yeah. pretty intense. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean. Oh, yeah. It was a big deal. That will be in the newspaper archives. Yeah, yeah. I guarantee. For sure. Right now, I'm look, trying to look up a name. I'm trying to remember uh, this. Uh, what the hell is his name? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pass that on to you. No, no, no. That's beautiful. You know, forgetting names. I love it. Oh, forgetting names. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it's all like complete. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Keep talking. I will find this in just a keep second. Talking, whoa, keep talking. Whoa, keep talking. Go grease the, lightning uh, burn. Tony Shuko. That was him. He was a, he was a fighter from uh, Boston. Right. And Ronnie, who I used to work with at uh, Robano's when I was bartending over in Silver Lake, taught, said... Tony was kind of punchy, you know, later in his career, and he was bartending and stuff. I mean, he wasn't bartending. He was uh, bouncing, and they wanted to fire him, you know what I mean? Because he was getting punchy. He says, you kids got to come, and you got to help me. You got to come there and start a disturbance, he says. Start a disturbance, and I'll break it up, and you'll make me look good, okay? Okay, fine. But Ronnie's the one of guys. You're setting yourselves up here. He's gonna, he might hurt you. <laughs> sure, this shit. They go there. He knocks every one of them out. Shards of teeth everywhere. I mean, knocked them all out. He kept his job, but these guys all ended up getting hurt. And Ronnie's like, I told you. I told you. He's punchy. He doesn't know how to hold back. He beat the piss out of these poor four guys. So, yeah. Oh, yeah that's what I said about Jake LaMonta. He used to have to walk <clears throat> in the street because he walked down the street just, you know, walking into people. Yeah. The Bronx Bull. Yeah. Oh, God. Boxing movies can be really good, you know. If if they're done right, you know, if they're done right, surfing and boxing. Surfing hasn't been done right yet. Boxing has, you know. Big know. Wednesday, no good. It's all right. Doesn't withstand the test ago. of time, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah it yeah. seems very dated. It's not timeless. Yeah, you know. I think it just you know, the problem with surfing movies is they try and explain surfing and they ended up sounding stupid. Mm -hmm. Don't try now, and if describe you, if you surfing. Had a, if you had a surf movie, what would that be about? Oh, I think you already know. Should I plug my work? That's what we're here for. Okay, we're I'll here. Plug my well, we're here to talk about how you got into writing. You started with articles, and now you now you've written how many books? Uh three, two, and one that hasn't been published yet. Right, it okay. Soon, but uh, the book I wrote is on Butch Van Artsdale, and he was the first Mister Pipeline, and the Bonsai Pipeline, you know, from Blue Crush. For those of you who are more modern, Butch he drank himself to death at thirty-eight right. years of age, and but. That, but the guy got that got me fascinated in him. You know, it's like, how do you drink yourself to death at 38? You're going full time, you know. Now, was he going with Jerry Lopez at the time? Jerry was like his Grammy. Jerry, right. Jerry, yeah. I mean, Jerry was, Butch was Jerry's idol. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jerry was like the third Mr. Pipeline. Butch was the first. Okay. He taught Laird Hamilton how to swim the North Shore of Oahu. You know, Who did? Butch? Butch, oh, oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, Butch was like a lot of mentors. First lifeguard on the North Shore with Eddie Aikau. A drinker, partier, fighter, part of the Wind and Sea gang in La Jolla, and drank himself to death. But um, just really interesting story, sort of like a Big Wednesday, Animal House meets Leaving Las Vegas. Right. That would be Butch's And story. where was he born? Uh, La Jolla. Okay. Well, he was born in Norfolk, Virginia. He was an right. Army brat, but he, he uh, or Navy. And uh, yeah, they moved to uh, La Jolla, Pacific Beach area back in the day, in the 40s. So yeah, he was part of, you know, just a lot of kids that grew up without fathers. Their fathers were military men, so they kind of looked to each other to... <laughs> right role model each other so when you have a bunch of cavemen on mm -hmm. the beach role modeling each other and learning it's just a one big wild party I and mean, there's so many anecdotes i mean just his who, story was just crazy who are the who, dudes now in the south bay that are out of their fucking minds that are you know how they go home fucking beating people up a lunata bay you're talking about palos verdes gang yeah yeah is that them? That, that, they're just no those are just thugs those are just spoiled rich punks no no well, that's not the way look dude I, when i was working at shithole we were doing a video, a surf prank video, and we go in and there, and I don't know if that's the dudes they're talking about, but we go into the surf shop, we're down in Redondo, I think, mm -hmm. and we're in a surf shop and we're getting some stuff and they start talking about those cats, uh -huh. these guys who work there. And they're not saying bad things about them, they're saying they're crazy, they're tough guys. Right. And then on our way out, they go, hey, 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 don't put that in. And we're like, what do you go, don't, don't put that in. No matter anything we said about them, dude, just don't put them in, put it in. Wow. 
So I don't know if that's a cat you're talking about. No, no, this is this is in the fifties and sixties. I'm talking about the, right now. Oh yeah, I'm talking no, about no. these guys who are down there right fucking now. Oh, if they're getting away with it, I'm pretty surprised because nowadays they're setting up cameras, they're busting people left and right. You know, well, that, that surf thuggery thing that used to be around, it, it, it doesn't fly yeah. really anymore. And they, some guy okay. tried that. You know. Dude, this is six months ago. And really? They, they okay. were, dude, they were straight out like they were talking about the mob. Wow, interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, this I'll was La Jolla down out. in the 60s and 50s. And those guys, they were pretty wild. You couldn't get away with that stuff now. Right. You know, but back then it was pretty, pretty wild. Right. But uh, Raquel Welch was a cheerleader when Butch was playing football at La Jolla High School. Really? Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. was same same crowd. Yeah. <laughs> the La Jolla crowd. Yeah. You know. So did he become a pro surfer? There was no such thing back then. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, that didn't start until like the mid 60s, and he was very against it. Uh, gotcha. The whole when, when contests became the norm instead of just something you occasionally did, he was very much against that because you know it just made the. Uh, what the ocean's your practice gymnasium now we mm -hmm. all have to clear the water because you got to get your practice in so yeah. you so now when longboards and beer became shortboards and psychedelics he was out yeah you know, but that was kind of the problem he took he he liked the recognition he got as mr pipeline and he enjoyed being a star surf star but then overnight you're a dinosaur mm -hmm. you know so it was sort of like losing his family in a way yeah so his drinking increased and yeah. it just it got really bad he got very disillusioned but he, i mean he had a contract with uh was the red sox or the red sox wanted to you know sign him and he was, he was a great baseball player but he decided to be a surfer instead mm -hmm. so if you're gonna be a surfer when i want to go as pro go for it but he, yeah. he didn't and but he became a lifeguard saved a lot of lives mm -hmm. it's more important yeah but it couldn't save his life unfortunately yeah. But it's a, it's a really fat, make a great movie. You know? yeah. Like I said, it's just sort of like Animal House meets Leaving Las Vegas. All right. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Have yeah, you seen but, uh, Lords of Dogtown? I did. Yeah. I thought that was pretty yeah. pretty well done. Yeah. Keith Ledger wait, and that. Wait, yeah. the movie? See, <clears throat> I have a problem with that because <clears throat> I knew Lunata Bay Boys. Is that who you mm -hmm. said? Yeah. Yeah, in 2016, Newsweek called the Lunata Bay Boys America's Most Notorious Surf Gang. Yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you, dude. Maybe we should cut it out. Maybe they're coming <laughs> after me. So the thing was, I knew Skip. You know what I mean? I used to go down there. I got my Zephyr skate from there, and we used to go down there. And I was a teenager, and I'd I didn't grow up at the beach. You know, I know Sean Penn talked about he knew guys like that who did Spicoli, but I didn't really. So Skip was the only guy at... at uh, you know, at uh, Zephyr, the skate shop, Jeff Ho's place. He was the only guy that that I knew that talked like that. So we used to go down there to wind him up. You know, he'd be working behind the counter. We'd go, skip, skip. The waves down there, man, they're like six feet in, in curling. He'd be like, no, no way. Tubular. I'm stoked. So we'd never seen anybody that talk like that you know what i mean at that time we were young we were fucking teenagers we go in there and just wind them up dude you ought to see it down there there's guys and they just got tube no way yeah, excited, huh? yeah. Oh, I, it, but and i don't know i didn't see the whole film you know the documentary is is much better but um you know and i love heath ledger you know so what you're I mean? saying his voice wasn't I, this how dude. He, this, well, this yeah. dude was out of control man we used yeah. to go in there and, and wind them up and he was he was cool he was a good guy Never gave us a hard time, but we just, you know, we we're kids. We were kind of messing with him, and he would just go, he'd just go nuts. No way. I'm stoked. So, um, Lingo. Yeah. <laughs> so you did interviews with friends for the book. Oh, that's all I did, yeah. Right. Uh, it took seven years to put yeah. that together. That took yeah. years. Yeah, half the people I interviewed are dead. So was he innovative? Butch? He, oh, yeah. yeah. Switch stance. He would do the switch stance. Right. Right, left foot forward. Oh, yeah. He was a power surfer. He, yeah. He was first guy to be doing switch stance and playing around on big waves and just, yeah. He was a phenomenal talent. But again, the alcohol kind of cut that short. Right. Yeah, for years. You know, it was his talent in the water and uh, his, his color outside of the water is what makes him such an intriguing figure. Everybody who was around then had a butch story. That's one thing I learned. Everybody has a butch story. So, where did he find the big waves and and i'm not being an idiot i mean back then you didn't have the people that would come before you i mean right. you know mavericks and we know the, sure. the there's a movie now and everything and right. and of course the billabong series and all that you see these they just, you know honestly just scare me to fucking look at them it's it's insane yeah laird hamilton with his fucking hydrofoil and you know getting towed out on uh you know jet skis and stuff yeah. so 
where where do you hear about this when you're when you're his age you know and and there's no there's there's no media that's telling you hey there's a 40 foot wave remember joyce hoffman yeah very star surfer the, one of the first great women surfers right. in the 60s her dad walter hoffman was a big wave rider at makaha back in the 50s okay the early pioneer gang of big wave surfers. okay walter hoffman took a picture of butch's friend jim fisher mm -hmm. who's still alive today he was at my last book signing uh fisher riding a makaha monster wave that was i mean and, and it got passed around in la jolla this picture and they couldn't believe their eyes you know they thought that they didn't even know waves like this existed makaha and they hadn't right. even seen why man yeah right you know the makaha the bowl about to swallow fisher he looked like a little cartoon figure right there. they couldn't wait to get over there and challenge themselves because you know wind and sea beach down in la jolla it's like a hawaiian wave and it's great training ground that's why so many of the great early big wave riders were from la jolla that area mm -hmm. So they saw that and they just couldn't wait to get over there. So Pat Curran, Tom Curran's dad, okay, he led the Mead Hall Gang is what they called them, all under the North Shore of Oahu, living in Quonset huts, just stealing chickens and pineapples and whatever else they can get a hold of, coconuts, to stay alive. You've been watching Brian Lally, Hollywood Native. Now I want to talk to you about something I'm really passionate about, and that's teaching acting. So I co-founded Lola's Acting School with my son, Kyle Lally, Lally or Lally Acting School. I've been acting for a, a long time now of 100 plus credits on IMDb, hundreds of plays I've been involved with over the years. And I just want to share that experience with you. What we do differently here at Lola's is we give you practical advice that you can use on a movie set, on a play, an audition, anywhere. We give you the foundation to build yourself as a great actor. If you come to us, you don't know anything. We can teach you everything you need to know to be comfortable on a, on a set and to excel. Don't just listen to me. Look at what our students are doing. Daryl Wesley, who is writing on two hit shows, The Game and The Upshaws, and Ben Barrett, who is a series regular on The Politician. Megan Davis, who is uh, playing Amber Heard in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard story. Come check us out. We're at the historic Arc Theater in the NoHo Arts District. You ever want to try plant-based eating? I have. What, you're a little confused, overwhelmed, you don't know how to get started? Definitely. Well, there's a simple answer to that. Go to Debbie Chu's Chew on Vegan YouTube channel. Debbie Chu is a plant-based RN. I've known Debbie for over 38 years, and she's very good at what she does. You go to the channel, and there's 300, over 300 recipes. They're simple, easy to make, and they're delicious. If you want to try it, you just might get healthy. Give it a shot. Chew on Vegan and surf these huge waves that they didn't even have the equipment for. I mean, they had right. was like made up like this table. <laughs> right. And they, they ate And they were lot. all long boards back then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's all they had. Short boards weren't for another 15 years. Right. Yeah. You know, they didn't, you didn't have guns, as they call them, like big yeah. wave guns. All you had is these planks. So they were getting crushed. Yeah. <laughs> but they, but they a lot of success, too. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And then the North Shore, that, that was Makaha, then the North Shore and stuff like that uh, later on in the 50s. That's mm -hmm. when Waimea and Pipeline started to get ridden in the early 60s. So yeah, it was it was all pioneer, and there was no not only was there no jet skis, there was no lifeguards. I mean, when you were out there, nobody even knew you were there really, unless right. you were friends with you. Right, you Jesus could be out there all by Christ. yourself, and yeah. all of a sudden, you know, why may I can go from fifteen feet to 25, 30 foot closeout like that, and you're you're in trouble. Yeah. Now what? Yeah, you know, there were surfers who were stuck out there all night. No, oh. and had to paddle in miles. I mean, just who almost lost their life, and some did lose their lives. Yeah. You know? No, I told you when we had some of those body surf contests at Zuma. And there are 10 foot swells and 15 foot faces. That'll bury you. Yeah, I know. And I told you the first time you go three, it's three, it's, uh, spin around three times under the water, and you're like, I may never, never get up out of here. And those guys are under two, three minutes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Did they practice holding their breath? You know, you see it in movies nowadays, you know, really, really holding there. He's like, you got to be, be able to hold your breath for three minutes to ride these waves because you're going to be under for. What could be forever. But I, what I wanted to say is when they were talking about they were out all night. So I'd go out and I'd get a wave or two. And then I'd go out beyond the breakwater and I'd just, I, I'd just tread water for 15, 20 minutes. And they'd be like, Lally was out there forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, was, I was hiding. I was hiding. Oh, I don't man. want to come in on that. Well, you got to train now for like Jaws, these 60 foot. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, this is all new. 
league now with Jaws right. and Nazare and Chopu and all those places. Yeah, you got to train for that. But for a man stuff, you got to be in good shape, obviously. But these right. guys surfed every day. It's what right. they did. So they were ready for it. Right. You know, you were ready for the hold downs. You knew how long it was going to take. So, you know, they didn't do any special training. Just they, they were watermen. They swam, they snorkeled, they dove, they did everything. They were always in the water. Did they call them logs back then? Or that's all they had? So they uh, just called them surfboards. Yeah, probably just your board, you know, yeah. Started off with the big redwood boards that would give you a triple hernia. And oh, then, my God. Yeah. And they got the balsa boards with the, yeah, that, that took some of the weight off. But, yeah, it was, it, there was a big evolution happening. And like I said, then the shortboards came and the whole whole mentality changed. I mean, like I said, it became shortboards and psychedelics and peace, love and hippie stuff. And Butch mm -hmm. wasn't into that. You know? yeah. he just what year did he die? 79. Okay. 38 years ago. So, so we had a group of kind of rabid followers. They, uh, oh, they, they dug him. Did he, almost like uh, John Coltrane, did he kind of... Uh, alienate people because he was so pure to what he was doing and maybe other people wanted to do uh get into what else was going on contests and and short boards and you know interesting question no i don't think he, no because he's really popular with people i mean he was a fighter and when he got right. drunk he could get mean but for the most part he's really popular with everybody everybody liked butch he had a great personality was he a but, teacher? Was he enthusiastic, enthusiastic about bringing people along? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He would show people the lineup and stuff like that. And, yeah. Like I said, he taught Laird, little Laird, how to swim the North Shore and not drown. Right. Yeah. He's really into it. You know, and Jerry and Jock and all those guys, Jock Sutherland. Yeah. He was, he was really, it, it was, they turned their back. It all, the scene turned its back on him. If you were either on the cutting edge or you were, you know, you what, were out. You were either yeah. in or you were out. Right. That was it. Mm -hmm. And Butch was still into the longboards. If you had, you know, don't even come to us with longboards. We're into what's happening now. I mean, yeah. Bush could still surf pipeline with the best of them up to the early 70s, you know what I mean? But he was, he just wasn't into those, you know, Jerry Lopez lightning bolt boards and stuff like that. He was a dinosaur. He was considered a dinosaur. The ones that made the transition were like Joey Cabell and Paul Strau and guys like that, you know, Corky Carroll. Right. Or Corky. Those guys all transitioned. Mike Bush. Purpose. Purpose, yeah. Although he was never really a longboarder. He was always sort of a, yeah. he was a flashy guy, wasn't he? purpose he was like the only californian in the early 70s that can get any ink everything was hawaii back then yeah. the purpose was so flashy he could get people to pay attention to him and clark gable's stepson bunker spreckles him. yeah yeah he made a he made quite a splash so that was his stepson he married stepson. he married spreckles, spreckles she had already the, had kids uh yeah and yeah. he had but he had john clark gable who was that with i don't know oh. i'm not sure a bunker so, i mean obviously came into a lot of money between gable and the spreckles right, sugar fortune right i mean he just had more money and too much time and he's gotten i think i think he got killed by a speedball if i'm not mistaken no. you know John, yeah. jason john belushi yeah pretty much now what about the florida surfers florida surfers yeah uh we got yeah. good waves but usually only when a hurricane gives us a little mm -hmm. little swing by yeah but um yeah i grew up surfing but out here just been too cold and inconvenient but i need to get need to get back out there that doesn't sound like a pussy <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna ask what are you with, uh, six four six five six four six what, five yeah. what do you weigh uh 230 pussy <laughs> <laughs> what about the sharks yeah there's a lot of sharks but no sharks that'll really kill you you might get your calf bitten off right. but out here y'all y'all got Great whites and no, nah, I've never seen one. No, nah? I'm sorry, okay. 25 years, never even seen one. I mean, they're out there, I'm sure, but I've never seen them. Yeah, either. that's yeah. the craziest thing when Jaws came out, yeah, and we were going to the beach every day. And people were like, I'd never go in there again. We never stopped, we never did not go in the water, not the next minute, not the next day. We went in every single day. And Joe's like, yeah. How can you go back in there, Jaws? I go, Everybody, we've been, we've been body surfing here up and down from the wedge to Ventura County line, yeah, our whole lives, and no one's seen a shark. I'm right. not saying that, that they weren't there, right. but but you know what I mean? People are like, don't go in the water. I'm like, I'm going to go in the water tomorrow. What do you? Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. There but, was a video recently of an Australian swimmer got bitten in half. Australia? Yeah. Australia, South Africa, San Francisco. Don't surf in these places. Yeah. <laughs> or don't swim there. Don't scuba down. You know, just be extra careful. Those are the three hot spots yeah. you know, up in Frisco and down here, you know. You know, it doesn't yeah. happen, knock on wood, Yeah, but it doesn't happen. Yeah, You know, like I said, 25 years, I've never even seen one. Mm -hmm. That's not true. I saw a dying thresher shark one time in the Malibu Lagoon. Okay. And that's a deep water shark. Yeah. It's not a man eater. So. Yeah. 
but that was I it. told you when I was a kid, we used to see the sand sharks at Zuma. Yeah. They'd just be swimming along around your feet. Oh, they're your friends because they're eating the damn stingrays and keeping you from getting stung. So yeah. you were going to ask me a question a minute ago. Um, I was going to ask, I piped did, in. Did, the, uh, <laughs> did the skateboarding, uh, the rise of skateboarding, um, or was that after uh, his time? Oh, that, that was the after. Butch. Okay. Yeah. That was after. Uh, okay. That's early. I'm a well, Bertelman, Larry Bertelman. That was mm -hmm. another disciple of Butch. Was, you know, he, he loved Butch. Okay. And knew, yeah. him, knew him well. And he was a little little kid at the time, little Grammy. And yeah. Butch was always encouraging him in contest. Even though Butch hated contests, he'd watch Larry and go, I like what you're doing because it's individualistic. You're not conforming to what these judges want. You know, the Bert move that mm -hmm. Bertelman came up with. Yeah. Butch loved that. Nice. I just sent Larry a free copy of my book. I just talked okay. to him on the phone about two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. Five Summer Stories plus four. Oh, jeez. I never see that anymore. We used to go to Santa Monica and watch it a couple of times a summer. It would come out at the theaters, I think it was 26 in Wilshire, and they're long gone now. But back then, they had this section, I don't know if you remember this, called the Magic Rolling Board. And these guys were going in pipes, not half pipes, they're going in pipes, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it was a crazy shit like we'd never seen before, like right. I'd never seen before. Now, the guys from Venice were doing it, and I saw those guys like at Kenner Avenue School. I saw Peralta and those guys, Jay Adams, Tony Alva. But but uh, we only saw them on the banks and stuff. You know what I mean? I didn't know about the pole shit, and I think I told you I never I never went to Venice. I mean, I went to Venice, but I told you a story where, where I was, um, there was a guy I was playing basketball with at Santa Monica College. His name was Sam, a red-haired guy, and he was like a legend, uh, you know, a Venice uh, Venice basketball courts legend. And so I went down there. I was in Venice one time. I saw him, you know, I said, Hey, what's up? And he was, you know, just tearing people up on the court. And I remember I was like, you know, do you think he's going to play like major college ball? And they go, no, man, you can't, you can't box him in. So that's what he was. But he had a buddy named Doug. I think his name was Doug had hair, like all the way down his back and they were Venice locals. And so they're on the wall, you know, they were standing on the wall. You down. told me this. Yeah. 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 And so I go down and I see Doug standing there. I see this guy. We're playing ball at Santa Monica College like all the time. And I see this guy. So he's with the Venice locals. On it, we got to be 20 of them on this wall. And they're fucking smoking, drinking, whatever. And I start walking up. And he turns around. He sees me. And he goes. Shook his head, huh? And I, and I turned around. I knew exactly <laughs> what that fucking meant. You know, you ain't welcome here. And I knew him, and I saw him later on. He's like, hey, man, <laughs> don't come by the wall. I was like, I, I got that. <laughs> caught, the, <laughs> caught the drift, man. Yeah. They would have fucked me up just for walking to the wall. Jeez. It was nuts. It's one of the things I don't like about, I mean, they say surfing is a tribe and stuff, but I don't like tribalism. I don't like localism. I think mm -hmm. it's ugly. You don't own the water. You don't own the beach. Knock right. it off. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's just guerrilla mentality. Right. I, I never, I could never abide by that. Yeah, you know, I hate it. I think it stinks. Yeah, yeah. It's growing fun. up, we served Ponce Inlet, which is like uh, Daytona Beach area, and yeah, it was always fights breaking out. Like, yeah. stay off the peak. Like, there was like a set area for yeah, the, yeah. the main guys. Well, they get territorial. Like yeah. they own it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I understand yeah. respecting people who've been there more than you are who are there every day. They're kind of your surfing elders. And yeah, you respect them, but don't, you know, I didn't come here to watch you surf. I came <laughs> yeah. here to surf and I'm going to catch a few waves. Yeah. Do you know Dylan Perello? Oh, no. Huh? Okay. He just really retired. I think he's about 30, 31, went back to school. But his, his mother is Karen Bartek, who's Steve Bartek's sister from... Uncle Boyko, Danny Elfman's oh, okay. partner in crime for, you know, many, many years. Anyway, he was, uh, they used to live in Latigo Bay. So he'd be going out, you know, Kyle went over to hang out with us, my son. They were probably like 10, 11 years old. And, and Karen w used to cut my hair. She did, she did hair for once upon a time in, in Hollywood. I mean, oh, she's done yeah. a lot of big jobs. She's really fucking talented Been doing it a while. But so we kind of went down there. I said, I'll bring Kyle down and hang out with Dylan. And so I'm getting my hair cut. And we look around. I was like, where's Dylan? He's like 10 years old, 11 years old. He's paddling out, man. A lot of go back. You know, and he was a professional. He just, he, he was, he was sponsored. He, he, he traveled the world, man, surfing. Just recently uh, went back to school. I'm like, <laughs> what kind of young kid is that, man? He's a surfer, a wild fucking professional surfer. And he's like, yeah, I'm going back to school. Wow. You know, surfing, that's one of the things I like about surfing. It's really good for 
actors, for artists of every stripe, I think, is it just gets you out of your head. Mm-hmm. You know, it really does. It gets you out of your head and just yeah. gets you into the moment. You know, I mean, we live in a time where we're just constantly we're either worried about the future or we're lamenting the past. You know, one is anxiety, one's depression. Yeah. The only place you're safe is the present. So yeah. that's, you know, surfing keeps you there. Yeah. For a, it's, it's kind of a resting, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I miss that. Yeah. Sure you don't have any other, nothing else on your mind while you're out there. Yeah. I mean, I used to work in a psych hospital. I liken it to a psych, you know, patients at a med line. You know what I mean? When, mm-hmm. you, when you see people fighting out there and stuff like that, it's like, this is their Prozac. This is their, you know, yeah. medication. And if, you know, there's too much competition, you're denying them. You know, it reminded me of the patients I saw in the med line, the psych hospital. Where's my med? Yeah, they start going aggro and going crazy. Mm-hmm. It's literally identical. Yeah. <laughs> the lineup in the water <laughs> and the med line at the psych hospital. <laughs> It's incredible. Yeah. So when Butch was drinking towards, let's say, the last five years of his life, was he was he wearing down physically? Yes. No, noticeably? Yeah, he was. He got demoted. He was a North Shore. He was the North Shore lifeguard, him and Eddie Aikau, and he got demoted to the to the uh, to Waikiki. And talk about a blow. Talk about losing your identity being complete. What happened was, I mean, he, in the early set, he, his, you know, his wife left him because he was drinking too much. A girlfriend had left him because he was drinking too much. Finally, he got involved with AA, and he was doing great for like, I don't know, like over a year. I was just talking to one of the lifeguards. I was like, yeah, he was doing so good. He was healthier. He was looking good. And then his friends all started dying. Eddie Aikau disappeared and drowned. You know you know that story about Eddie Aikau? Yeah. Hokulea. He drowned. Uh, Jose Angel drowned, who was another famous big wave rider. It just all these friends started dying, and it just, it just put him on his final bender, you know? Next thing you know, he's yellow as a banana peel, and then he's he's dying in the Wahiwa hospital. So yeah, it was the deaths of friends. He just couldn't. It was one, two, three. All these close friends were just dying. You know. Yeah. You so, know, I've said it recently. And I'll probably say it a lot on the podcast. It just seems like people like that gave all they could. Yeah. And he was done. Yeah. You know, he led more lives than than most people. My life seems boring. When I read about it, it's yeah, like, everybody has a Butch story. I doubt everybody has a Doug story, you know, that I know. Yeah. A few do, but right. I mean, I couldn't put them all in the book. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's he was kind of done, and he used to say that I'm done. I don't care. They, you know, the doctor told him if you don't stop drinking, you're gonna die. Oh well. Well, I had a friend who did that in recent years. Guy's probably been more than five now, but yeah, I had a friend who did the same thing. He was just a dude, man. Just a buddy of mine. He said. He had some fungus on his hand, and they were like, yeah, if you stop drinking to take this medication, he's like, that ain't going to happen. Mm. And he died that wonderful life that so many people do. They drink themselves to death. They found him days later in bed being eaten by bugs, you know, bugs on him because they find their way in. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. anyway. So, you know, we always like to end on, a, uh, on an upbeat. Uh, Scott, are you here? I would say no. <laughs> Something happened. The inmates are running the asylum. They are. Yeah. We had so many more subjects yeah. to cover too. Yeah. So you think Why that, just didn't go, go ahead. ahead? I was just gonna say, you think his drinking was just that surfer beach lifestyle, or you think he had some? some oh, he had deep rooted, uh, much deeper. Yeah. He was an abused child. His dad was an uh, yeah. SOB and beat gotcha. him up when he was a kid. And, and today they probably diagnosed him with some sort of major depression mm-hmm. major depression yeah. yeah half those guys they like, they, someone told me it was like craig knoll you know the bull he said it was like someone took bellevue psychiatric hospital and dumped the inmates there at the beach at wind and see it was just yeah. crazy yeah. Yeah. real interesting story that we were talking about jaws remember the story of the uss indianapolis sure, you know yeah. what i mean where the ship went down and the sharks ate everybody uh butch is uh butch was part of the duke kanamoku surf team the manager was was Kimo McVeigh, who was also the manager of Don Ho, the Hawaiian singer. His father was the captain of the Indianapolis. Dang. Yeah, so I interviewed him about six months before he passed, and he he was telling me the story, and it was, it was amazing. I couldn't believe it. You know, he committed suicide himself. Captain McVeigh did because he couldn't take the people writing every Christmas, uh, "Merry Christmas." We would have a better Christmas if you hadn't killed our son, and you know he just couldn't take it anymore. So he put a pistol to his head back in '68. But he didn't like the adulation. No, not at all. Jeez, yeah. But he's been exonerated since then. Right. And the Japanese uh, commander that or admiral that torpedoed him testified at his court martial, defended him. Didn't do any good. They needed a scapegoat for all those dead, dead servicemen. So, but well, that was really interesting. What was he? He was getting blamed for the evacuation. For like getting, because he didn't do it. There was a thing ship. back then, which is 
now outdated. You're supposed to do a zigzagging motion if you're in enemy. Serpentine. Serpentine motion, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he didn't do that. So they were saying that's the reason these guys were dead. Well, the admiral said, I would have gotten him anyway. The Japanese uh, admirals, yeah. I would have gotten him anyway. I wouldn't have helped him. Yeah. They didn't care. They wanted a scapegoat. And yeah. they got it. Yeah. Very that's sad. a shame. Fascinating story. Scott, how uh, long have we been going? Uh, we're just about probably an hour or so. So, yeah, if you want to keep going a little longer or close. Want to talk about L.A. officers? Scott, you, oh, <laughs> shit. Yeah, I mean, we could. We could say we could do a part two. We could do L.A. authors. I mean. You guys. We can do uh, the boxing stuff. We can do whatever we want. Whatever you, what do you guys think? want to talk about. What are you working on right now? Uh, Tales from Tower 13, which is, you know, where I work. I work with troubled teens, teaching them how to surf. and. Um, so I've got a lot of beach tales mm -hmm. <laughs> that I've accumulated over the years. So I'm working on that in another boxing book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, boxing history, like I said, fascinates me because it's, it's, you know, even as an actor, it fascinates me because you learn how much different things were for immigrants. You know, they came here because they wanted to escape what was going on in Europe. And they come to West Pennsylvania is where I focus my, my attention, like Pittsburgh especially. And... You know, you have Hungarians and Czechs and Slavs and Poles and Irish and Black, everyone coming here for a better life. And um, they're in coal mines and they're in factories and foundries and stuff like that, working these backbreaking jobs. You know, Pittsburgh was an industrial town, but a lot of enterprising young men saw, you know, I can make it this much, much as my father who's breaking his back and getting black lung, it, I can make as much as he makes in two months in one night by boxing. So you have the South Side Polish, they had their boxer, you know, with the North Side Irish, they had their boxer. You had the Hungarians from Garfield, they had their boxer. I mean, every neighborhood had its fighter and they would get together in this raucous, you know, converted church or a, sometimes an office building. Sometimes they'd pitch a tent, you know, out yeah. in the woods and stuff under lantern light yeah. and have boxing matches, which so were it was like the Pikes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Most of them were Irish. If you look at all those early champions in right. the turn of the century, they're all Irish. And then when they moved out of the ghettos, it's the Jews and the Italians. Then they moved out and it was the blacks and Latinos. Now you're seeing the Eastern Europeans. Yeah. But yeah, but that's, so that's, I, I like to write about that because it's, it, it tells the, it just, it's not just a story of boxing. It's a story of, you know, the, the different ethnic groups, the waves of eth ethnic groups that came here and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So and how you can make a better living. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One night, you know, at first the parents were just adamant against it. No, that's bestial. That's terrible. And da, 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 da. But the next thing you know, the money starts rolling. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, dad it. doesn't have to have black lung anymore. You yeah. might break your violin hand, Joe. Yeah, yeah exactly. Harry Greb, the grip, who I consider to be the greatest pound for pound fighter of all time. His father spanked him. So don't you dare. You know, Teddy Arrows, his dad burned his boxing gloves, and these guys all ended up being providers for their families. Did not right, he usually pay family. his dad for the spanking? Oh, jeez, <laughs> here we go. Did you uh, <laughs> Did you enjoy the fighter? The Wahlberg, okay. Christian Bale? Who, who oh, the brothers? fighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sure, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, that was really yeah, good. Yeah. Like I said, if you find a good angle on it, I like it. I thought, I th when they first said they were going to do, you know, Ron Howard was going to do Cinderella Man, I was like, oh, brother. Because yeah. I knew the story of Jim Braddock. I was like, what, what are you going to tell? Yeah. What are you, okay, he was down on his luck and blah, blah, blah. They did it. Yeah. I thought it was a great movie. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was too. Man. All right. I'm going to wrap it up, I guess. Uh, that's kind of, that's my segue. Ah, was okay. that smooth? I uh, guess we're going to wrap it up. Oh, thank you. Uh, I guess. But no, but we're going to have you back because it was a fantastic day. Thank you. Uh, love the surf stories. And we're going to come back. We're going to talk about boxing. And we could talk about L.A. writers. Because nothing I love more than Los Angeles and yeah. being, being born and raised here. And uh, I'll tell you about why I didn't get into Bukowski for so many years. But Ham on Rye may be the best book that I know on Los Angeles. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, uh, anyway. Can I plug my book? Uh, you can plug your book, okay. your website, whatever you'd like uh, to plug. My and, book, and look, let me say yeah. thank you. Huh. Thank you for coming out today. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank great you so day. Much. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, you guys made it fun. Um, but my book is Remembering Butch, the Butch Van Artsdale and Story. Remembering Butch, it's available on Amazon. It's an oral history. I mean, there's some of my text in it, but mostly it's the guys who were there telling the story. Mm -hmm. So you get to hear firsthand. It's great because it kind of insulates me from any sort of harsh criticism because yeah. I've had some people say, oh, that's not the way it was. I'm like, really? So who's your argument against? Yeah. You got a hundred yeah. people here who say otherwise, yeah. you know? Yeah. Everyone thinks their own narrative is the narrative. So yeah, so it's called Remembering Butch, the Butch Van Artsdale and Story. And uh, yeah, there you go. hopefully we can get a producer to... to uh, Make this into a film because yeah. I think it'd be a great one. Like I said, surfing has not been done right. It's been a joke so far. I think it would too. We got some people looking at it, as you know. 
you know, hopefully it'll go somewhere there. But any, do you have a Instagram or? Yeah, well, I have a uh, Facebook page for it called Remembering Butch. Mm -hmm. And I also have one for my Pittsburgh Boxing History page, which I think people will, people will be surprised, even if you're not interested in boxing or interested in surfing. I think you'll like both those pages. And what is the Pittsburgh page? Pittsburgh Boxing History. Okay. Yeah. And it's you based on my book, Pittsburgh Boxing, A Pictorial History. Do you have an Instagram? I do. I do have for the boxing one. I don't for Remembering Butch, although I think there is one. I think his daughter runs the Remembering Butch one on Instagram. What's but, the Instagram for you? Do I get to pull this out of you? What are yeah, you, old you guy? do. Well, Pittsburgh <laughs> Boxing. Me. Pittsburgh Boxing, same Instagram. thing. Pittsburgh Same Boxing. Thing. Pittsburgh right. Boxing. You got Tic Tac? You making dance videos? Uh, you know. <laughs> no. Never. Never. I, I have a problem with social media. I don't like it. Yeah. You know what, dude? I don't like it. Yeah. What you're, it's the world we live in. Yeah. For and, business, uh, it's fine. Well. For social, nah, I'd rather be here talking with you guys. <laughs>